Yep, Missouri weather, you can't beat it. Be a snowstorm one day, freezing rain, tornadoes. The only thing we haven't had to my knowledge is a hurricane. Now we've had the remnants of a hurricane a few times, but not the actual hurricane itself. And I guess we don't want them in Missouri, amen? I don't guess we want hurricanes in Missouri. All right, take your Bible, turn to John chapter 3, if you would. John chapter 3, there's a phrase in here that when I was studying it, just grabbed my attention. I've studied this phrase several years ago and got a blessing out of it. And uh, I just like, I like the things that Jesus says. I guess that's good for a guy in my profession, that you like the guy that, you know, wrote the book on what you're doing. So, uh, but I like what Jesus said here, and I like how the, the Bible and our beloved King James Bible ties everything together. And remember this, uh, that the Bible was inspired as Isaiah, John, Paul, Peter, Moses was writing these things down. The Bible says that Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God gave them the exact words. They wrote them down. They did, they did it faithfully. God did not allow them to make any mistakes on that, which is amazing. Um, because nowadays we put erasers on pencils and we buy bottles of white out. I don't know if people still use that anymore. That was for typewriters. Nowadays, we hit the backspace button 23 times to get back to the mistake we made and erase all of that, and that's all well and good, but these guys didn't make any mistakes. And then throughout the years, God preserved those manuscripts, not the original ones, but the copies of them, and God did not allow mistakes to be made in those copies. And then God allowed it to be translated correctly, and that's what I believe. According to 1 Corinthians 14, it's translated correctly. And let when he said um, at the mouth of, or um, if someone speaks in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three and let one interpret. And I've learned to rely upon this one interpretation. So you have the oldest, who wrote the oldest book of the Bible? Does anybody know? The oldest book written. I've said it probably, I don't know, a couple dozen times. The first writer to write something in the Bible. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Job! Very good. Roy, give him a dollar. <laughs> Actually, Roy, I'm not going to do that to you. Give him five dollars, okay? Job. From the, and Job, they think, lived probably about the same time of Abraham. So Abraham lived about 2,000 years before Christ. We lived about 2,000 years after Christ. So for 4,000 years, think about that. 4,000 years, Job's writing, then Moses comes along, then Ezra, the faithful scribe, compiles things, puts it all together, and then we have the writings of the New Testament all preserved for us in three different languages over the course of 4,000 years from over 40 or around 40 different men. And yet when you read this, you can tell that it had one author. One author. When you read it and you believe it, you can tell it had one author. And I'll show you that tonight. John chapter 3 verse 22 uh, we're doing a study of the Gospel of John. We'll read this. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Then we'll have our prayer time at the end. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. Um, and I, have to, I think I have to throw this in because um, I think the Bible indicates to us that Jesus never actually did the water baptisms. I believe his disciples did that. I'm going to have to look into that. Seems like I have a memory of a verse somewhere. But anyway, I think his disciples were the ones who were doing the baptizing. 
And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salim because there was much water there. So think about it when it comes to your neighbors or your relatives who go to a church where they do not baptize by immersion. They baptize by sprinkling and they think that's the right way. Why then was John baptizing in a place where there was much water? Why did he have to? If all they had to do was just sprinkle somebody, then all you need is a bucket of water or a cup. Dip something in it and sprinkle it on them and say, okay, you're baptized, that's it. But that's not scripture. When uh, Philip was in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch, the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And I'm sure he probably might have been carrying a pitcher of water or something like that. But what he knew and understood and what we understand is that it takes much water if you're going to put somebody all the way down and bring them all the way back up. You want them not just sprinkled here on the face, but the whole body. That's to me, there's the basis for why we do what we do as far as baptism is concerned there there was much water there that's why john was baptizing there verse 24 for john was not yet cast into prison we all know what happens to john once he gets cast into prison he gets his head chopped off then there arose a question verse 25 between some of john's disciples and the jews about purifying and they came unto john and said unto him rabbi he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, and he's referring to Jesus, when John baptized Jesus, uh, whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Now, it looks to me like you had a lot of religious zealots who were trying to get John and Jesus and their disciples angry at each other to destroy one another. Let me just say this. This is a very powerful weapon that our enemy has. And that is taking people who are unified and destroying that unity by stirring up strife. What was the one of the seven things that the book of Proverbs said Seven things on abomination to God, he that soweth discord among brethren. Somebody who goes to one group and says, I'm your friend, and oh, I love you guys, and, and then that other group over there, boy, they, you ought to hear how they talk about you. Oh, they tear you down, they cut you down, and all that, especially that girl over there. And then she'll wait till this group starts talking about all those people over there. And then when they're not looking, she goes over to that group, Stirs it up over there. And I've seen that. We had a Christian school here. I've seen it happen. And I just go, I don't get that. But that's how some people are. That's what's happening here. The devil is behind this and he's trying to stir up discord between John and Jesus. And um, so he says, uh, verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You underline that in your Bible. The clothes you're wearing right now, the food that you ate, the shoes that you have, the air that you're breathing, the blood that runs through your veins, the house that you live in, the knowledge that you have, the salvation that you have, the faith that you have, the grace that you have, the forgiveness of your sins that you have, all of those things came to you as a free gift from God to you from heaven. Every one of them. And then he said, um, so John basically, I think he gets it. I think he knows that they're trying to stir up. And he said, what do you think I'm like trying to beat Jesus at something? You think I'm, you know, trying to build a bigger religion than he, or get more followers than he has? Is that what you think? And John is saying, anything that I've done and any blessing that I have shared with anybody did not come from me. It came from God, from heaven, and it happened to have come through me. 
but I'm not the originator of the blessings. You remember that. Next time you start getting a little proud about who you are, what you are, what you believe, what you stand for, and so on, start thinking about that. And he says, um, man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. And he says in verse 28, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. See, that's what's at the core of this. I'm not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. And he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. And John is like, I'm not the bridegroom. I'm not here to build a big religion and steal away everybody's disciples. I'm not here to do that. Which, boy, let me stop here for a minute. Think about what's happened, what's come to light since COVID. All the locally owned stores, restaurants, places of business that mom and dad ran, family owned businesses, locally owned businesses. When all these states started locking everybody out of those shops, they just went out of business. Some survived, but they didn't have billions of dollars in reserves to carry them through. Who is it that gained? Well, the big companies like Amazon and the people who can deliver things to you and, you know, um, what is it? The people that deliver your food? DoorDash and, and whatever else. They're the ones who've gained. All the big guys at the top are the ones who made all the gains and they crushed all the little guys, okay? Because that's how they think and that's how they operate. And what I see happening in churches or in churchianity in America is I see the big churches getting bigger. And how are they getting bigger? They're advertising and they're putting campuses in areas that already have a church. And their intention is to produce a a show that just dazzles and pleases the flesh and people will say, well, you know, they didn't do that in that little church we went to. I like this church much better because then I can shove the kids off and don't have to worry about them. And they go to those churches and they support those churches. And it's about the big churches eating up and gobbling up all the little churches. That's exactly what I think is going on. That's, that to me is a deliberate plan of the devil. And John's not going to play into this. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. I'm not the bridegroom, he's saying. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's who John is, which standeth and heareth him, in other words, like his best man, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. And that's how you're supposed to see this thing. That's how we're supposed to see our church. That's how we're supposed to see the work that we do. In that God always gets the glory, he gets the credit, he gets the praise, he gets the honor, he gets the adoration. He gets all of that. He gets the thanks. And sometimes I find myself wanting men's applause or men's approval or men to... Slap me on the back, Mike, you're doing a great job. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Boy, Mike's great. Sometimes I find myself wanting that. That's my flesh. And Brother Doyle, man, he preached such a good sermon Sunday. He said, God hates your flesh. Get it out of the way. And when I am to the point where I'm saying, God, you receive the glory, you receive the praise, that's where I'm supposed to be. He must increase, but I must decrease. And I guess literally, in a literal sense, John decreased when they cut his head off. Now there's not as much of John to go around as there used to be. John, and, and when you think about it, where, let me ask you this question. At this time, Jesus is about 30 years old. He's started his ministry. He's baptized of John. Did you ever ask the question, where's Joseph? Because we know three and a half years later, as Jesus is on the cross, he gives his, 
Mary, his mother, over to the custody of John, his disciple, his beloved disciple, and says, you know, son, here's, here's your mother. Take care of her, in other words. But where is Joseph, the husband of Mary? I think the Bible doesn't say anything about it. So it's not a huge point. But I think Joseph has died by this time, is what I think. So that there is, number one, no question, isn't he the son of Joseph? Well, Joseph's gone. Joseph's not there. And generally, in patristic cultures like that, where the elder fathers got all the honor, Jesus would not have gotten, in my opinion, the honor that he got had Joseph still been alive. For somehow, some way... Joseph is removed off the scene. I think he died when Jesus turned 30 years old or somewhere around in there. And now it's just Jesus. So that when he references his father, makes no mistaking that it's not, he's not talking about Joseph. Joseph has decreased so that Christ may increase. John has decreased so that Christ may may increase, and we as well. And then verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. And I could, well, I could run, preach on that for a while, but I won't. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And yes, I will say, there are carnal churches there is a carnal type of Christianity. A worldly, flesh-pleasing type of Christianity. A Christianity where your flesh is blessed, your flesh is appeased, your lusts are fulfilled, and everything that goes along with it. They let you keep all of your sin, let you keep your abominable lifestyle, let you do all sorts of things in the face of God and tell you that God's not going to hold anything against you. Everything is okay. That's what he's talking about. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. And I think that's a reference to Antichrist. And he that cometh from heaven is above all. Verse 32, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. Nobody believes him. Verse 33, he that received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. And what does he mean by this? Christ came literally from heaven. John the Baptist did not. John the Baptist was not consciously aware of anything until after he was born on this earth. He was born of a human man and a human woman. But Christ was different. Christ was with the Father before the beginning of time, before the creation, Christ was there. If anybody knows God, it will be Jesus Christ because he was with him. He knows what heaven looks like. He knows who, what God looks like. He knows what all the angels are named. He knows everything about heaven, the universe. He created it all. He knows it all. You trust him. Amen. And so verse 32, what, uh, verse 34, for he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. Words of God, plural. Words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. In other words, he's got the full, he's got all seven of the seven spirits of God. He's got them all. God doesn't withhold anything from his Son. Then he said, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all all things into his hand. I have that underlined. Because that's where we're going. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth in him. If you ponder that phrase for a minute. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. If you think about what that actually means. It means that while we're here on this earth right now. We're not actually seeing what life really is. All we see is corruption, death, decay, sorrow, sadness, sickness, sin, 
Any other S words? Okay, that's all we see in this world is the corruption and the death that is in this. This is not the life that God has planned for us. You cannot have your best life now. Cannot. So we have not even seen life yet. But he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Father, I ask your blessings and your grace and your mercy upon your word tonight. Father, I pray to your God that you would fill hearts with knowledge and give them understanding. And Father, from that, Lord, that you would guide us and give us wisdom to live in the world that we live in right now. It's getting dangerous. It's slowly getting more and more dangerous as every day that goes by. The serpent truly is more subtle than I think he ever has been. And people are falling away because they do not regard your word. They care nothing about it. But Father, I don't want that to be me. I don't want that to be my family. I don't want that to be my church, my children, my grandchildren, my friends. I don't want that from them. Father, I want them to know what this book says and to be confident in its promises and its blessings and be warned, Father, by its prophecies and be warned, Father, by your anger at us. Father, have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Now back to that verse 35. The Father loveth the Son. Now take that, what we just studied here a few Wednesday nights ago. In John chapter 3, same chapter, verse 16, for God so loved the world. So you have to, kind of have to ask the question, who does God love the most, His Son or the world? Neither one is above the other. The way I see it, God loves His Son, His only begotten Son, but God also loves his creation so much so that he is willing to give his only begotten son as the sacrifice for man's sins. It would be like if you had a set of twins for your children and they were both just, I mean, they were just angels in your sight and you loved them both dearly, but you were asked to give or commanded or demanded that one of them you must hand over, one of them you must kill, or one of them you must allow to be killed. How in the world do you make that choice? How do you make that decision? And here it is, God loves his only begotten son, but he loves also you and I. Think about that for a while. Take that home with you tonight. When you sit down after the service tonight, don't turn the television on for a while, just think about God loving his only begotten son, but then God loving us and him having to choose who to bless and who to lay the curses on. I'm glad I'm not God. Amen? I, I could not, I could not make that choice, but God did. When you consider what was done for you, it will cause you, it should cause you to say, thank you, God, for saving me, for protecting me, for abiding with me. The one son, Jesus, was the good son. He never did anything wrong. We're the black sheep of the family. We did everything wrong. And aren't you glad that we have a brother in Jesus who didn't say, Dad, they don't deserve it. Our brother, our friend, our Savior, our Lord, our King said, Father, I'll do it. Whew. That'll bless you, amen. The Father loved the Son and hath given, and I want you to underline this phrase, all things. Now, I've talked about that for years. You, you remember it, Melissa, okay? All things. And I can't remember when that just reached out and grabbed me. It's been years ago. 
But I've studied this over and over again, and I love this phrase, all things. Who could think of a verse in the Bible that has the phrase, all things in it? Any, let me ask the question differently. Who, who is awake can think of a verse that has the phrase, all things in it? Go. Yes. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. There's more. In fact, there's 220 of them, so I need to hurry because I got 220 points in my message tonight. Not really. But I want us to look at this first, get this picture. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. Now, is there anything that he's left out? No, if he says all things, he means all things. Now, some might say, some might say, oh, let's see here, Matthew, um, turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Oh, look, fell right on it. Verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And he's talking about the day when he's going to send his angels from the four corners, from the four winds to gather together his elect together. He's talking about the day of the Lord, that day, the day that we don't know what day that is. He's talking about that day. And I, I've just always pondered that in my mind. How is it that God can know something that he hasn't told Jesus? Well, I believe he will. I believe that at some point, he literally does give all things into the hand of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, and he says, go, it's yours now. Okay? Let me show you what I mean. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. This, think of this phrase, all things now, so, Caleb, since you, uh, since you uh, answered the question, you beat everybody in the whole church on that verse. You knew it. And nobody else did. So when it says, I can do all things through Christ that, with strength, does that mean that you can walk sideways up walls? No. Does that mean you can fly to the moon and back on your own? No. What does all things mean well we're going to see what it means in revelation chapter 5 and i want you to jesus didn't just say the father's given me all things the father hath given all things into his hand revelation chapter 5 and i saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now that book matches several things in the Bible. Number one, it matches the Ten Commandments. The Bible tells us plainly that the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone, that they, the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God on the front of those two tables of stone and also on the back of those two tables of stone. And I've made a point to say, I think the reason why is, number one, they're written in stone because you cannot erase stone. The only problem, if you remember Y2K, the only problem in the world that happened with Y2K was you had a lot of people, couples, who bought gravestones, grave markers for Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so. And whoever died first, they buried Mr. so-and-so. And to save money, they went ahead and had Mrs. so-and-so dying in 19... And then they left the two last letters. They didn't know what to do. You can't erase what's carved in stone. So you had all these tombstones with 19 and a blank space there. Because now it's 2000 and she ain't dead yet. Okay? That was one of the problems they had. In fact, that was the biggest one. So anyway, so you can't 
take anything. You can't take letters that have been written in stone. Number two, you can't add anything to it. You cannot take anything away from it. It's written with the hand of God in stone, written on the front and back. Also, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, at the end of Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel says, I see a hand came down to me from heaven, and in that hand was a roll of a book. And he said, I could see that on the book it was written on the front side and on the back side, lamentations and mournings and woes. It is the exact, what you're seeing here with Moses and Ezekiel is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who is now standing next to his father at his right hand and his father is holding not a book, the book. The book of everything. In fact, I'll say it like this, the book of all things. Where do we get our doctrine from? The book, the one book. Our faith from this one book. What we know about the earth and the heavens and God and Jesus and devils and everything else, every mystery, every question, what, what we want to know is in this one book here. And I've settled it a long time ago. I'm not going to go searching anywhere else. If I want answers, I'm going to go right here and say, God, show me the answers right here. Amen. So it's, it's written on within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals, just like Christ is. Christ is sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He has the seven spirits of God in him and on him. And he has him without measure. That means God didn't just give him a little of the Spirit. He gave Jesus the whole thing. Verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Now, I made a funny joke down in Harrison, Arkansas, about these people on the Internet who are trying to figure out the mark of the beast, which people saw that video until YouTube stupidly took it down. That's twice now, Roy that YouTube has taken down a video of mine saying that I lied and made false statements about COVID. They are so stupid over there. They're letting, you know what they're doing? They're letting their robots read and listen to their, and watch their videos instead of a human being. And you're worried about artificial intelligence. I'm, it's artificial, but I'm not so sure about the intelligence part yet. But they put a strike against my channel, which means I can't upload anything to YouTube for a week. I'm in, like, YouTube jail. And I didn't do anything wrong. Boy, it irritates me. But anyway, I made a joke about people on the Internet who are trying to get some video out there hoping that they've guessed what the mark of the beast is before anybody else does. And it's like they think they're going to get a prize or something. And I'm going, you people are nuts. You're, you're crazy. You know what? You're crazy. You're actually hoping that you're right about the mark of the beast and it comes right now. And I've still got people that I want to see saved who I don't want to get that mark. You're actually asking God to usher in the end of the world and there are still people that I care about that I don't want to see them die and go to hell. Idiots. And so if you look at this, Verse 3, no man in heaven nor in earth nor neither under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereon. Nobody, 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 nobody is capable of understanding one single word out of this book except God give him understanding. Nobody is. Not me, not any of you guys, not even John, the man upstairs. And I wept much, we would too, if there was a famine in our land, a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. If you remember, and, and maybe you didn't hear all the story, but the, 
Remember the Waco incident, the Branch Davidian compound, the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms burnt those people down, burnt that building down, killed those children. Terrible, terrible massacre. David Koresh's whole holdup on that was that he said he had a revelation about the seven seals. And I can tell you that, and this comes from the people who escaped the compound the day of the fire, that David Koresh is basically, he was a one-note preacher. He preached one sermon over and over and over again, and every sermon he preached was about the seven seals, seven seals, seven seals, seven seals. And he was trying to have, he was going to dictate to somebody who was typing out his vision and understanding of the seven seals. And, one, and he believed that once he did that, that God then was going to break forth with his wrath and judgment on the earth. David Koresh, whose name was not really David Koresh, he changed his name because he saw himself as Christ's second coming. He made it all about him, is what he did. He's not worthy, I'm not worthy, you're not worthy. There's only one, and it's Jesus Christ. One, verse 5, One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Those seven horns, those seven eyes, I know that sounds weird to us, it sounds odd, but that's what he looked like. Having the seven spirits of God. But this, the eyes, what do you do with your eyes? You see things. Christ can see everything. The number seven is the number for completion, perfection. Christ can see everything. He knows everything. The horns in the Bible represent an animal who's got horns. If you find yourself tangled with an animal that's got horns, don't fight the animal with horns. The animal with horns is going to win his way every single time. That's what the horns represent. He's not only has the ability to see, he has the ability to have authority over everything. And, uh, and in verse 7, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now, Christ has all things in his hand. All things. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. This is an, a wonderful event because Jesus now is about ready to start opening those seals. Now it's time. If you've ever wondered, I've mentioned this the other day, we wonder why, God, are you taking so long? God, when are you going to do this? God, when are you going to unfold things? When are you going to reveal this to me? God, when are you going to help me? When are you going to heal me? Jesus got the book in his hand. Just give me a few more seals and you'll be ready. Amen? Now watch this. There's a picture of this. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Beautiful picture of this. Always a foreshadow of everything in the Bible. In verse 2, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation. Uh, he's talking about the book of the law. Before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. There's a number seven there. It's going to connect you to the seven seals, the uh, seven horns, the seven eyes. In verse 3, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Next time you complain about my sermons being so long, Ezra read, didn't do anything but read the scriptures from morning until noon. That's a long sermon. But you know what? When you're hungry, it won't bother you. So he read from morning until midday before the men and the women 
and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Aniah and Uriah and Hilkiah and Maasiah on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah and Mishael and Malchiah and Hashem and Hashbadana, or is that Hashbanana? Hashbadana and Zechariah and Meshulam. There's 14 people standing on this stage. Ezra with the six on one side and then the other seven. Watch verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people. You getting this picture? Christ is above us, amen. And when Christ opens the book, there's glory. When he opened it, all the people stood up. He hadn't even read it yet. Their reverence for the word of God was so great that all he had to do was open it and the people jumped to their feet. Because you know why? They said, God's in the room with us. God is with us today. They knew it. Man, I, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm excited. I'm a little bit happy. Either that or I'm crazy. One of the two. But this blesses my soul. Anytime I can be with God and he opens the book for me, I guarantee you there's going to be glory. I've never had a time opening up God's book where I said, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. I don't know why I read this goofy thing. Never. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And I'll tell you something. Jesus starts opening seals. I think graves are going to start popping, getting ready to burst open. Amen. And Ezra blessed the Lord God the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen! With lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Listen, they had revival. He hadn't read a thing. All he did was open it up, and they had revival. Listen, I want to tell you people, you want to have some revival? Open your Bible up. No, no, no let me say that differently. If you want to have revival, ask Jesus to open the book up for you. You can't do it on your own. We've got people in this church never made it past 8th grade. And yet they're the smartest, wisest, most learned people in the world because Jesus opened the book for them and to them. And I've asked you before, do you believe God created the universe in six days, 6,000 years ago? You're smarter than Bill Nye, the science guy. You're smarter than, who is that Japanese guy they always have on the news all the time? Ichio Kaku. They always get, bring in physicists and astro astronomers and smart people and ask them all these serious questions. Just ask a born-again Bible-believing Christian. He'll quote scripture for you, Amen. There's power in this book. There's, there, right here in your Old Testament is a picture of the book being opened. Like you see in Revelation 5. There's another picture. Turn to Luke 4. Luke 4. I love this one. I love this. In, in fact, um, the picture of Moses... As I mentioned before, the tablets were written on both sides, so that also is a picture of Christ coming down from heaven with the book in his hand, and it's his authority to rule. When Moses ruled over the Israelites, he did not make up the rules as he went. Those rules and laws were given to him by God, and he wrote them down. The Ten Commandments, God wrote himself. And then the rest of the law, like the sacrifices and the Sabbath days and all that stuff, uh, Moses wrote out, hearing from God and wrote it all out. Moses' authority and his ability to rule over those people was given to him by God by way of the book. Now, I'll tell you something. Somebody in this church called me here a while back 
And they were, you know, they're asking me about the election and they were kind of upset like, you know, a lot, a lot of people were. And he said, Pastor Mike, what are we going to do? This guy, he's, he's the president now and I don't trust him. I think he's going to steal the country. I think he's stealing money and this and that and the other. And he said, I, I, I just don't know what to think. And I said, well, think about what our country is. Is he the king? No. Is he God? No. We live in a constitutional representative republic. There is not one man or woman in this country who actually bears rule and gives all the rules. We actually follow a system of government that's written into a constitution that's not easily changed. And I said, think of it that way. If you still believe in the Constitution, then let that be your government. He said, hey, I like that. And that's how it is in Scripture. You don't like me. You don't like some things I say. You don't want me to be your pastor. That's fine. I'm okay with that. But let the book rule over your life. Amen. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias, which is Isaiah. 66 chapters in Isaiah, 66 books in the Bible. You're getting the whole picture right here. Jesus is acting this out in front of everybody. And if any, I just think there had to be some guy there who had just read Nehemiah the day before. And he sees Ezra opening the book and all the people stood up to read. And here's Jesus taking, taking the book of Isaiah and opening up and reading it. And he's probably going, wow, I just read this. I wonder, is that our Savior? Is that our Messiah? And so it was the book of Isaiah. And, and he says when he had opened the book, there it is. He alone is worthy to open the book. When he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to who? The poor. Brother uh, Sam showed us the poor people in India. I guarantee you those people are hungry, starving to death, not just for rice. They're starving to death for somebody to love them. Wouldn't it be great to help that man give them the love of Jesus. Somebody say amen. And uh, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Because what follows after that in Isaiah wasn't ready to be fulfilled. What follows after that says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus didn't come the first time to bring the vengeance of God. He came the first time to bring the salvation of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the tenderheartedness of God, the compassion of God. That's what he came the first time to bring to this world. The second time he's coming, he's bringing the wrath of God to this and the vengeance of God. But he closes the book right here. And it says, he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. You see, he was claiming to be the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. He's either the most arrogant jerk that there is in the world, or he's the son of God who is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Amen. So he closes the book and says, this is fulfilled this day in your ears. And let me just say, we're going to close in a little bit, but let me, let me just say to you and those of you here, those of you online, you've been praying about something. You've been asking God for something. You've been pleading with God for some kind of help some kind of aid, God to do something in your life. I've been there, and I'll be there again. I think maybe God wanted me to say to you that, I don't know who this is for, but some of you, God is saying, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now I said it, 
boom, there it is. Don't know who it's for. Don't know what it's about. But whatever you're praying for, whatever you're asking God for, whatever blessing that you absolutely need and, can't, and you don't want to live another day without it, one of these days, God's going to say to you, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And I mean, you'll shout, you'll cry, you'll weep, you'll get happy. I've done that before too. Let me give you an example where we're going when we meet together next Wednesday night. Matthew 11, here's the phrase, all things. Look this phrase up in your Bible. When you get home, put it in your pure Bible search software and look it up. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Here's, in fact, one, two, three, four, five places that I could find where Jesus is showing us all things are delivered unto me of my Father. How many things? All things. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither, nor, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Everything that you know about God, it came to you from Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Everybody in this world thinks they know who God is, or they think they know God. They have a version of God that they worship that they dwell on they've maybe crafted their own god but you don't know god unless you know god through god who is jesus christ luke 10 22, all things are delivered to me of my father and no man knoweth who the son is but the father and who the father is but the son and he to whom the son will reveal him john chapter 5 verse 20 for the father loveth the son and this is he, it's almost like he's repeating himself this is in john chapter 5 for the Father loveth the Son and sheweth him all things that himself doeth. God's not keeping anything now a secret from Jesus. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. And I've said this before. And I believe this. I believe that the days that are ahead of us are better than the days behind us. Now, I like to watch old movies old TV shows, and look back at the old days to see how they did things, how life was back then. And I would give anything to have that time machine to crank it back and go back maybe 70, 80, 100 years, something like that, and just live. But that's not ever going to happen. Because I actually had the formula for the time machine written down. I lost it. I don't know where it is. But I believe the days that are ahead of us are better than the good old days that are behind us. I've got something to live for. I really do. John 13, 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. John 17, 7, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me, this is Jesus' prayer to the Holy Father, not the Pope. Amen? Not the Pope, Joe. Don't call a man holy father, that's blasphemy. Jesus was talking to his father and he said, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Jesus came from God. And when we accept Jesus, we are accepting God himself. One more and then I'm done. But the comforter, John 14, 26. The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you what? All things. So you're reading the Bible, you see things you don't understand, ask God. See that sign up there that that man sent me, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not? My favorite verse in the whole Bible. Because I know I can ask God questions and if I ask him at some point, He'll answer me. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, I believe in Bible memorization, but I also believe in Bible reading. And if you happen to forget it, at some point when it really matters, the Holy Ghost will make you remember the verse. John 15, 15, Henceforth I, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. How many things? All things. Again, we don't hide our doctrines. 
We don't have secret services that we don't allow the public into because we don't want them to find out what our real doctrine is. We don't have anything like that. Everything that we believe and everything that we know to be true written right here in this one book. And we don't say, oh, you can't have a Bible. That's not for you. Give it to them, amen. John 16, 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall shew it unto you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. You want to know who God is? Read your Bible. You want to know what God is? Read your Bible. You want to know how God thinks, what God allows, what God will not allow, what God will tolerate, what he won't tolerate? You want to, you want to know things? Open up your Bible and read it. This is Jesus Christ. He has already opened this book up for us so that we can plainly read everything that God has to say. Reason 72,185 why I believe that every word in this book has to be 100% correct and cannot be wrong one time. Why? Because it came directly from the hand of God and put into my hand. Amen. And I'm not... That's just getting started on the message. I'm just getting started on this. You want to have you some fun? Type that into your computer and just run with it. That, and I, really, everything that I'm showing you is New Testament only. By the way, as we look at our prayer list, do you know how many times that phrase is found in the Bible? The phrase, all things. The number for revelation is 22. The phrase all things is 220 times exactly. 22 times 10. Okay? And, and that's what really hit me. I, I went, whoa! And look at that last verse. He shall show it unto you. That's revelation. That's God opening your eyes to things in this book that you never knew were there but it'll take you reading it. Amen.